folks, this morning I'm not being political, underscore not, being politically correct. Last I checked, the body of Christ has men, it has women, it has boys, and it has girls all involved in it. So, rise up, O church of God. The hymn is number 576. Gracious and loving Father, you have been so good, so kind, so merciful to us. You have seen us from the beginning of our days and brought us up to this present time. We come to you this morning as a people to express our love and our appreciation for you, to give ourselves in praise, and to give thanks for your care over our lives. You have wooed us by your Holy Spirit. You have called us unto yourselves, and you seek to use us for your glory. Do with us what only you can, through your power working in our lives. Father, we will not lose strength, because we trust in you, and we lean and depend upon you. Help us as we seek to do thy will. We thank you for loving us, and we thank you for showing us your way, your will, through your word. And now as wonderful children that experience your love, we pray in the confidence that you taught your first disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand now as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his son, the Son of God, who was received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under conscious power, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God and God for all life. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
I have a super secret surprise. What is it? What is it? I know. It's, it's, it's something I, like, try to hide from people. Like, I had to dig it up. It's in a box to protect itself. Are you sure? Do you think I could show it to you? You sure? You positive? Yeah? Okay, let's see. <gasps> Look. I put it in another box. <gasps> Just to protect it even more. Okay, all right. So, let's see. You think... Are you sure you're ready? You're really, really ready. You're really, really, really ready. Okay. I don't think you're ready. You ready? Okay. I put it in another box just to hide it some more. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I think this is the last layer of protection. I think this is the last one, okay? Are you sure you're ready for it? Yeah. You think you are? Okay. These are some super secret priceless treasures that Miss Katie likes to keep. But I hide it away because I don't like um, always to show it, okay? I'm scared that something might happen to it. All right, let's see what it is. Ready? Ooh, what is all this? Let's see. Keys? Do you know what those are keys to? My very first school building to West Corinth Elementary. I was supposed to turn them in, <laughs> but I didn't. Because those are my keys. Those are the very first job I ever had. And it was the very first classroom I ever taught in. So when we got ready to um, leave that school and go to Corinth Elementary, our new school, uh, Miss Katie kept her keys. Don't tell Dr. Childers. He's in the back. Don't tell him. All right. So that's a treasure. And then I have my name, Miss Katie, right there. And I have, do you know what that's called? Chalk. Chalk. Mm-hmm. Yep, because that's what I wrote with long ago. Your teacher still writes with chalk? That's an awesome thing. I, I, we don't have chalkboards anymore, so I got an eraser because sometimes I'd make mistakes, you know. Then I've got an eraser that someone painted for me. Yeah, i got to erase it to put more stuff up. You're right. And a markers and some ABCs and a pencil. And look, here's my name tag. Do I still look like this? No. Mm -mm. No, that's dark-haired Miss Katie with... Um, a lot of, yeah, I did. I, I know. I, I, they would look at this and say, who is that? That doesn't even look like you. But that's me. Long time ago, that was in 2013, which is not so long ago if you're Miss Katie. And then um, you were born a year after that. Wow. Huh. <laughs> you were born two years after that. I'm back in the 1900s, so I feel you on it. All right. So, um, and Miss Katie has a pencil. A lot of times I'll doodle. What do you think that was? What did I doodle? Church and church. Church and the church. This was our old church where we church went, and there was a, the that's the crosses. That was the wall with the big crosses. So when, and there's the steeple. That's right. The steeple's out there on our walking trail. Have y'all seen it? Uh, you haven't seen it yet? Well, y'all can go out there and see it. John Thomas working on a pergola out there, so you guys can go look at that for his Eagle Project and celebrate him and hopefully a few days when we get that joker done. And another box and another. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's why this is treasured for me. Okay, hold on. Here's why this is treasured for me. Miss Katie prayed to God when I was a little person like you, and I said, Lord, help me know what it is I'm supposed to do in this world. Help me know what it is I'm supposed to be in this world, how I'm supposed to help you. And so God gave me talents to be a teacher. What if I took all this teaching stuff, all these memories and this teaching that I have inside my heart, and I put it in a box, and I put that box in a box, and I put that box in a box, and I put that box in a box, and I, box box, and I covered it all up, and I closed the boxes, and I buried it down in the ground, and I never showed anybody. What would happen? Huh? We, we might forget that Miss Katie can teach, right? And then I get to sit and talk to you guys. And everybody might forget about God and Jesus. See, Miss Katie's not talented like Miss Sarah back there. I can't play that organ and piano like she does because she does an amazing job. And I can't direct a choir or sing like this beautiful choir over here does. And they bring beautiful music to ours. I can't preach like Brother Kim and Miss Elizabeth. I can't preach like that. But what I can do is sit here and talk to you guys. And I can teach. And I can love children and teach them about Jesus. And guess what? You have talents too. In our Bible story today, we're going to learn about someone who gave people talents. 
One of them he gave five talents. Somebody else he gave two talents. Somebody else he gave one talent. Two of them grew their talents, and they made them bigger, and they expanded the kingdom. One of them buried them because he didn't want anybody to find out what would he didn't want to lose it. He didn't want to, you know, have it stolen. He said, ooh, I'm just going to hide it. Do you think the person who gave him the money was happy that he hid it and did not help grow it? No. no. He said, I gave you a little, but you didn't even try to grow it. These others I gave a little. I gave them what they could handle, but they grew it. So what God gives you, your smiles, your stories, your hugs, your amazing things that you come to this church to do, you have talents to share just like Miss Katie does. We don't want to keep it buried and hidden away. We want to share the talents we have to help build the kingdom of God. And we're going to go to the back, and we're going to talk a little bit more about ways that we can share our talents with other people in our community, okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us hear your voice when you tell us what our talents are, when you give it to us. Lord, sometimes it's just a hug or a smile, or a letter, or a card, or a picture. Lord, you put so many talents in your children, and they share them daily with us. Help us be like children, and grow your kingdom, and share your good news and love by sharing our talents with the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
what a mighty fortress He is. Amen? I praise God for that. Well, good morning to you. God bless you. Today's scripture is from Matthew 25. Hear the words of Jesus. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you have given me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now, I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, investing crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now, throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This passage of Scripture is set in the context of a teaching discourse by Jesus we find Jesus sitting among His disciples on the Mount of Olives, teaching them. Jesus taught His disciples in parables or stories that principalized spiritual things into practical things so that they could be easily applied to everyday life. In this passage, He begins by telling His disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like. Let's look closely into this parable so we can glean some principles to apply to our own lives. I see a three-part division. The first division includes verses 14 and 15. It's the commission of the followers or servants. In this section, we're introduced to a rich man who must leave home and go on a long trip. He leaves his affairs to his servants, expecting them to be good stewards who will handle the business favorably and profitably until he returns. When the master returns, he will expect an account of the effort given by the servants. 
he will ask if the servants grew his investments or not. The symbolism is easy to deduce. We see the wealthy master as a representation of our Jesus after his resurrection from the grave and ascension into heaven with the promise of returning to earth one day. The servants represent Jesus' followers, the disciples, those from 30 AD all the way forward to us in 2023. The text states, that the master called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it into proportion of their abilities. In some translations, the word talent is used. Some call this portion the parable of the talents. What is a talent? Well, in the ancient world, a talent was a unit of weight. A, and, and in this case, it was a weight of silver. According to Vine's New Testament dictionary, a talent was equivalent to 6,000 denarii. Since one denarius was the wage for a day's work in the fields, according to Matthew 20, verse 2, that's roughly equivalent to what would be earned in over 6,000 work days, a little over 16 years worth of wages. So the rich man entrusted a large sum of money to these three servants. I've read in two other commentaries that this could be up to 400000 or a million dollars in today's value. So this was not a small sum of money. But the lesson from this parable is about way more than money. In this parable, the talents can also represent our moments, the time that God has given to us. Additionally, the talents can represent our momentum that is built from the energy, strength, skills, and abilities that God gives to his people. Money, moments, and momentum are all gifts God gives to his people, expecting us to use them to grow and increase to the maximum extent possible. Let's not miss the details here. This is a man who knew his servants, just like Jesus knows his followers. When Jesus commissions his followers, he does so in accordance with their abilities. When I visit nursing homes and hospitals and shut-ins, a lot of times I will read Psalm 100, verse 3 to the people. It says, Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. The Good Shepherd knows His sheep. He made us, and He knows what we are capable of. He also knows how to grow us in our faith. Which brings me to the second division of the passage. In verses 16 through 23, we read about a celebration of the faithful. This is the place where we find the most famous, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, the one that we all long to hear spoken over us. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Like the first servant who was given five bags of silver, some of us are trusted with lots of money. I would assume that the master felt comfortable giving such a large sum of money to this servant because he had ample opportunities prior to proving his ability to multiply and maximize his resources. We read in the text that this servant went to work right away, investing the money and doubling it for the use of the master. The second servant, 
was likewise trusted with a large sum of money. And after quickly getting to work, investing that money, he produced a 100% return for the use of his master. The third servant was given the same opportunity to prove himself to be faithful. But the text tells that instead of going to work to earn more, he dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. Each was given a distinct amount of money, a set number of moments or time to work and produce, and the opportunity to extend the momentum that the master's careful planning and commission propagated. Like the servants, we as followers are all entrusted with an opportunity to show what we are made of, to show what kind of character and abilities we possess so that we too can have an active role in the momentum of the kingdom of heaven. Each of the servants was only expected to give an account of what they were willing and able to produce with their talent. We see in the next verses, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Notice that servant three did not have to report on servant two or on servant one, but only for his own actions. As the first servant presents his profits and earnings, he is celebrated for his faithfulness with great praise and accolades. And then he's promised even more opportunities in the future. Likewise, the second servant, he reported on what he brought back, his, second, his extra two bags of silver. And that servant, likewise, was celebrated for his faithfulness. He received the same praise, the same accolades, and more opportunities. Finally, the third servant comes forward to report. But unlike the first two servants, this one decides to report on what he believes the master is like. He begins his presentation with, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. A false understanding of this master becomes his servant's excuse for laziness and fear. Which brings me to the third division of this passage. In verses 24 through 30, It tells of the catastrophe of the fearful. Have you ever heard someone blame another falsely simply because of their own lack of work ethic? I find the third servant's slanderous characterization of the master to be his way of allowing fear to steal the profits of the money, to waste the moments allotted for work, and to stifle the momentum given by the master. Even though the master knew his servants, I don't believe this master knew his, this servant knew his master at all. If his accusations of the master being harsh and greedy were true and valid, wouldn't the first two servants felt the same way and been even more fearful with the extremely large sum of talents? Over the years, I have pondered this section many times, trying to understand what made this servant think his master to be harsh and a greedy man. The text states, by the servant's own admission, it was fear. The servant was afraid of the master and afraid of the prospect of losing his money And fear led the servant to passivity. He chose to do nothing with the talent or money he was given. He knew what his master expected, but he failed to act because of fear. This further validates my assessment that the third servant didn't know the master very well. The truth was that due to his own inadequate feelings, 
the servant tried to get out of his responsibility by blaming the master as a source of his paralyzing trepidation. If the master was hard and difficult to work for, wouldn't the first two servants know that as well and consequently act in fear? What I suspect was really going on in the third servant's mind sounded something like this. I'm afraid I'll lose, so I won't even try. I'm afraid of failure, and I don't want to embarrass myself. I'm afraid to try something I've never done before because it might not work out. So I'll just play it safe and hide what I was given. Fear can be the enemy of faith. It even receives a reprimand by Jesus in Matthew 8, 26. In my study time, I found some interesting fears or phobias that people have. Have you ever heard of pallidophobia? It's the fear of baldness or bald people. How about catophobia? It's the fear of hairy people. How about odontophobia? It's the fear of teeth. Thacelophobia. It's the fear of being seated. <laughs> well, this one's my favorite. Phobophobia. Want to take a guess? It's the fear of being afraid. Seriously, though, have you ever seen someone bury talents in the ground because of a lack of faith or an abundance of fear? What a catastrophe that can cause. Particularly, Lee, looking back in American history, what if Abraham Lincoln had talent over fear? What if he had allowed the fears associated with his own feelings of inferiority due to his lack of formal education, two failed businesses, and the eight elections he lost? Even though he suffered nervous breakdown, causing him to be bedridden for six months and suffered from bouts of depression, President Lincoln went forward in his pursuit of justice that made history and changed the course of America for the better. Lincoln famously declared, the probability that we may fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. I could not imagine a United States of America where slavery was still legal. And just as Lincoln had, you too have special talents that beckon to you to be used for great accomplishment. We can avert the catastrophe that befalls the fearful, if we will step out in faith, knowing that we can trust our loving God. I can hear the master telling the servant, you were afraid you would lose the money, so you didn't even try? The money or the talent wasn't even yours to lose. You weren't taking a risk with your own money. It was my money. And I was the one taking the risk. I wanted to give you an opportunity to show what you're made of. I have big hopes and dreams and plans for you. But I needed you to at least take a trusting, even if fearful, step in my direction. I was trusting you with my own assets and I was hoping you would be brave enough to trust me. I can see the master sadly shake his head and look over at the first two servants who worked and invested and produced a great return. And then I can see the sadness turn to frustration, seeing the momentum of this commission come to a screeching halt. 
I can see the master becoming very upset and very mad at fear because fear causes people to step back, to hide, to retreat, even during times of forward momentum put into motion by God Himself. Fear can hold us back from all the wonderful things God has planned for us. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. I believe He would say to His servant and to us as His followers, if you knew I harvested crops that I didn't plant and that I gathered crops I didn't cultivate. Didn't you realize that I was doing that on purpose? I was allowing you an opportunity to nourish the seed by planting it and cultivating it. You see, the seed is mine. The initial investment is mine. Likewise, the fruit of the harvest is also mine. I could do all the planting and cultivating too, but I wanted you, I wanted to allow you to be a part of the happiness and joy that comes from the harvest. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul teaches that each of us are only God's servants through who the Lord gives work to do. One of us plants, and another waters, but it is ultimately God who causes the increase of His seed. John Wesley teaches us that provenient grace of God is ahead of us, each of us, and He's the one wooing us and drawing us closer to Him. He initiated all of it. And then He chooses to allow us his followers, a place in the kingdom of heaven's work by investing the money, the moments, and the momentum we are each given. Then he even gives a celebration to the faithful by causing us to experience true happiness as we go about being a blessing to others. It's a privilege to be entrusted with money, moments, and momentum to work towards God's purposes in the world. The implication of this parable is that if we are faithful with those talents, we take our place among all the faithful, trustworthy servants of God, no matter how big or small the accomplishment may seem. Now this is not a parable of works righteousness, leading us to believe that we have to work to earn salvation. My friends, that is a gift. But this is an instructional story describing how we, as God's servants, are given many opportunities to make a difference in this world for Jesus. And those of us who act responsibly and faithfully with those opportunities will be rewarded and given even more opportunities. Those of us who choose not to invest will be miserable, like the servant who forfeited his talent and was cast into a sea of unusefulness, darkness, and misery. I felt particularly led to speak to you today about this parable because of the stewardship campaign that is well underway. We have heard from various ministries in our church that are using their talents of money, moments, and momentum to enact change in a broken world and to shine a bright light that attracts others to the good news of Jesus. Now who better can we learn from about stewardship than Jesus himself as he gathers his disciples in close and gives them instructions on how to live in the kingdom of God on earth and how they are expected to manage the money, the moments, and the momentum they've been entrusted with. All of us who have lived a few years recognize that nothing on this earth really belongs to us anyway. 
Our controlling, grasping fists have to be pried open sometimes. But what relief comes when we can freely and openly surrender our lives to the Master's use, knowing that is the best investment we can make and truly is only our reasonable duty. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice because He thinks you are valuable. Therefore, every day we live our lives on this planet should be a day that we are grateful for salvation and the assurance of eternal life with the very One who made us and loves us. And if we are truly convinced of our assurance in God's love and truly understand who God is, then it behooves us to share with those in darkness. If today you don't feel particularly assured of your salvation and you want someone to pray with you, please come up here to the front of the church during our last hymn. We will be so glad to pray with you. And also, if you want to make a concerted effort in investing the talents that God has blessed you with, we would love for you to partner with us in this church by welcoming you in today. First Methodist Church, keep the momentum. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.